Hello, I'm John McKean, and finally, I think I've got this recording to work. I'm here to introduce Walter Siegel, who perhaps in Walter's way needs little way of introduction. For most of the next 15 minutes, I'm offering you snatches from an, an unscript Siegel talk. But first, back in the 1970s, the economist E.F. Schumacher published Small is Beautiful, Economics as if People Mattered. I was the reviews editor of an architectural magazine at that time and sent it to Walter Siegel to review. Her thoughts were fascinating and a snippet is quoted in the epigraph at the front of our new book. This title could have equally been for Siegel's own achievement. Small is beautiful, architecture as if people mattered. As a motto, I place it alongside Patrick Geddes's century old, think globally, act locally which equally fitted Siegel, whose own act locally meant using the local builder's merchant as his self-builders well knew. Two good mottos to help sustain our planet. <clears throat> For the first published profile of Siegel half a century ago now, I was commissioned by Peter Murray, now chairman of New London Architecture among much else, but then editor of Building Design, and who may be among you down Walter's way this afternoon. I began by describing Siegel as one of our liveliest young architects, although already of an age when most of us are retiring. Siegel was an individual. All his life, and one who later in life, helped others' individuality to flourish. He had trodden his own path through the European modernist landscape of the 1920s and 30s, where the artists and architects we all know by name now were his family friends. In our new book, I tell how he sidestepped them all and then how he became for three decades an English architect before at retiral age, he reinvented his architecture. Then he developed the most subtle but common sense and approachable house building method and encouraged his clients to assemble their houses themselves and to plan them themselves. A couple of weeks ago, out of the blue, Pat Bora, architect, timber frame expert, and leading Siegel self-built teacher, sent me some excerpts from an extremely lengthy, typically lengthy, talk by Siegel, which he had recently uncovered. I'd love to play bits of it to you, but the recording is so poor, and Siegel's Germanic voice is further obscured by his ever loose-fitting teeth and cigar holding them together, so I've transcribed a bit. So here is Siegel at the Center for Alternative Technology in 1980. To work on a building site as I had when I started was a horror for me. The working conditions, incapacity, bad weather, we were exploited, the conditions were degrading and inhuman. I had always a desire, not only to assist to change conditions for whom you build, but particularly those with whom you build. For the experience of the working people on sites. And in the end, I found some way out of these matters after having tried every other year for a new system of building. The older generation of architects thought they were God-given innovators who determined every size and dimension of everything instead of simply understanding there was an industry, the building industry producing materials that already had been produced by highly intelligent people. And so it was not for the architects to try to tell them their job, but to use their products. And then I realized I should be able to resell materials after the building's use ends. So I had to use the materials in their market sizes, not cut them about, simply assemble them. That was a turning point in my career. I could affect reduction in costs, even down to a quarter, including the relatively high resale value of the material components, dismantled, dismantled as they had been assembled. Far from changing the world, housing architects must accept the much more modest role using what society had produced. It was totally different sort of thing from the innovator demanded by the older generation. Now, I interrupt Siegel to note that, of course, 
phrases like whole life costs and circular economy were unknown 40 years ago. Siegel thinking was extremely prescient. And now back to his talk. For me, it was just a duty and a job to use what the industry was giving me, rather than to tell the industry what to make, which is what architects usually do. Self-build is a very wide field and doesn't necessarily mean with your own hands, but be in control of your own plans. Architects time and again try to interfere with certain processes in life, social habits and so on, telling people how they should live. This was an imposition. So I encourage clients to learn to make their own plans, to think about it, and so obviously the aim to open systems and incorporate the maximum amount of individual arrangement and also take away the mystique and, and let the individuals find a way into the whole operation, away from the feeling that you went to an expert. I had been there. I had had to free myself from the perfectionism I was trained in. So it became obvious, completely obvious to me, I would be learning to build without general contractors, like the Scottish separate trade contracts. And for that to be possible, I had to reduce the number of trades in my building. In traditional building, typical masonry building, under a general contractor, there are maybe 20 to 22 separate trades. Acquiring the power of the general contractor to myself as coordinator, reducing their number was crucial. I ended up with five trades. Groundwork, that's foundations and drains. Carpenter and joiner. Roofer fourth electrician, and then plumbing and heating. I could manage this extremely well. My clients always had very small sums of money. I'm not a rich person's architect. I've never been that. I haven't got that flair. I could tell any client right at the beginning, within 5%, what their house would cost at the end. You as an architect are in a position of trust with the client's resources, and my client knows he'll never be landed with unexpected expense. I also needed the element of adventure, an element of risk. I had confidence in my skills acquired over 28 years, and the innovation elements were intoxicating and intoxicated my clients. And my clients of this past 15 years always welcome me. We exchange greetings and Christmas cards now that was Siegel talking in 1980, amid his new career, from when Siegel was in his mid sixties until he died nearly 80 while Waters Way was being built. Back to his talk. It should be very fascinating and very enjoyable task to build for yourself, your own house, using your own hands to do something, a great element of happiness. Putting up a structure for themselves is in many people's lives the biggest adventure in their life. To facilitate this for people is a very excellent task for my own profession. And I hope that eventually people will understand that this forms another social relationship, which Link has been allowed to be completely submerged in more esoteric issues. If you think of building a house for yourself, the first and hugest problem, in England especially, is to find land. All I can say is, I wish you luck. It's like finding a needle in a haystack. Land is a commodity which is very difficult for the individual to obtain. Now, this is me speaking. If I may interrupt Mr. Siegel just for a moment, it's worth reinforcing this point. For the, there was a huge groundswell in favor of land nationalization after the Second World War. On the crest of the new Labour government's wave of education reform, the founding of the National Health Service, bringing in new planning controls. <coughs> Land nationalization, which had been advocated in a 1946 book which Siegel co-wrote, and with which Anirin Bevin, creator of the National Health Service, wrote the foreword, sadly, like the ending of private education, never quite made it. I quote, land monopoly is not the only monopoly, but it is by far the greatest of monopolies. Unearned increment in land are not the only form of unearned or undeserved profit. 
but they are the principal form and they are derived from processes which are not merely not beneficial but positively detrimental to the general public. That was the Home Secretary, Winston Churchill, on land taxation reform before the First World War, 113 years ago, before the war which scuppered the land reform plans of Lloyd George's government. But now back to Mr. Siegel in 1980. My present conviction is that the issue of land can only be done unless you have a very large amount of money available, with the support of a group or a housing association, or most preferably with a local authority. However, this country is not suited for self-building. It's a very tender plant with many enemies, some of which have come out, others have taken root. It is a political task without doubt to make this clear to government that it provide the necessary structure that will facilitate self-building. We here have Lewisham. This is the first time a local authority in the United Kingdom has initiated a self-build scheme available to members on its housing list. I cannot really see without any drastic changes how you will manage to make, uh, obtain this very first commodity, the site. I have had clients look around sometimes for years. One couple, the first of my clients to self-build, did for four years, watching land costs go up every year. They eventually found a plot six miles from Bedford. They spent £10,000 on the site. Of course, the house cost less. Unless you are rich, it needs cooperative effort and a group in order to do this. I'm, I'm inter interrupting Siegel just for a second to say that uh, that image of Siegel you saw just now was him sitting in that very first self-built house which uh, where I photographed him in the mid 1970s. Some years later, Siegel said in 1982 that Ken Atkins house, the first Lewisham house built in the late 1970s had cost 9,000 pounds. And for this, he had got a hundred percent mortgage from the local council. Siegel added that the houses around you today and being built as he spoke would when complete and after his death be named Walter's Way be quote, something between 16 and 17,000 pounds. Wow. Now back to Siegel. Local authorities have difficulty fitting this into their party political structures. Their accountants can't integrate the self-build finances. Labour councils are usually not terribly friendly with people who wanted to build their own hands, with their own hands. The Tories, well, as I was said to a friend of mine trying to organise in Westminster, they declared basically, you mustn't deprive the poor speculative builder and developer of his profits. Labour, rather ridiculously and very differently from Lewisham, but in normal Labour councils, in London, in Islington and Lambeth, for example, have the view that if he puts in equity in the form of his own labour, he becomes a minor capitalist, an investor, and he becomes an exploiter, and so on and so forth. And this is therefore uh, against labour principles. Small investors are undesirable. With a social building for a Sussex University, just when about to start, the, Sussex, the students' union finally voted down self-build as it would be putting building workers out of the job. These things are not really very friendly. It is an uphill task, self-build. But self-build can be extremely valuable, even though it will never take over not only financially or economically, but the ethical side of people finding a way back again to using their hands in a useful manner, of having the satisfaction of having done something for themselves, having worked and having also the opportunity to discover how joyful it can be to work. And you can also develop as a person. I noticed at Lewisham over a couple of years they develop a personality quite beyond expectation. It changes personality with opportunity, with encouragement, with a task to perform. Without regimentation, without any rigid control, it has led these people somehow to grow and develop into quite different creatures. And it also gives their architect the greatest enjoyment to see. In Britain, the government, the Department of Environment, is not in favour. All negotiations for support tend to be watered down and delayed. 
So for those in the greatest need of housing and the most willing to do it for themselves, they find that self-built is a very uphill task. The government has produced a booklet called Self-Build. This is one of the most diabolical documents I've ever come across because it avoids all the issues from the very beginning. It starts, when you have obtained the site, and then it goes on in that sort of way, goes in into silly organizations. Here the problem has been the technology and the organization. Usually other groups organize themselves and try to involve the services of an architect. And I have to say that my own profession in very many aspects on the technical side are practically unemployable. It is those things that you look vainly for to get assistance from, those you will not get from a normal architect. A normal architect has many wonderful ideas of how you should live and so on. But when it comes to brass tacks of things, it's a very dicey kind of thing. And so on went Walter Siegel's unstoppable extempore thoughts. That was a tiny, virtually unedited extract from a typical Siegel two hour talk. In 1982, a couple of years later, the most important and perceptive essay in Siegel's lifetime on the Lewisham self-build was published in the Netherlands by Jan Westra in a scruffy, marginal, hand-produced journal. Interesting piece, but his title is a good way to sum up the story. Being the builder builds the being. My story in our new book ends with a snapshot of Siegel the person. In the words of Nicholas Taylor, who is with you down Walter's way today. Of course, the story continues, beyond mine, in our volume Alice on Siegel's continuing significance and a crucial anchoring tale, as does your actually being in Walter's way itself. But here is his final client on Mr. Siegel himself. Walter had a distractingly puckish exterior, the domed head bobbing up and down, the false teeth falling over themselves with enthusiasm. Yet, what I remember most lastingly about him was his perfect courtesy to all, his high expectations of everyone, and the way in which he exemplified those virtues of real equality that his self-built houses expressed on the ground. Goodbye and enjoy the day. With it. the end, it was a little picture of me and Mr. Siegel, taken, as you can imagine, a few years ago. <laughs>